Controversy continues concerning Natalie Wood's death. Raquel opens in New York. The Stones go to Detroit. The Kingston Trio stages a comeback. Teddy sings up a storm while Robert Stack shoots from the hip. All this plus news about Scott Baio's new series, the return of Ed Kooky Burns, a new sound for Eric Estrada, and a big night for some little stars. As Entertainment Tonight comes your way for Wednesday, December 2nd, 1981. Natalie Wood was buried today in a private ceremony quietly removed from the Hollywood looking glass where she spent virtually her entire life. But even on this day, there was no rest for the controversy surrounding her last hour Sunday when she drowned in a Santa Catalina Island cove off the coast of California. Her husband, actor Robert Wagner, is in seclusion, in shock and grief. Detectives say he will be re-questioned about the case. The skipper of the boat involved in Natalie Wood's death has returned the yacht to the mainland, and he has not been available for comment. Detectives say he, too, will be questioned again. At a news conference Monday, the coroner's office reported an argument had preceded the drowning. It was a non-violent argument. In other words, they were arguing about general purposes. We don't know specifically why. There was no physical altercation. Each of the two gentlemen were examined. People looked at them, our investigators, as well as sheriff's investigators. There were no physical marks or whatever. Well, was, she, was, just, was the argument serious enough to make her no. feel that her safety was in danger and therefore she had to leave that yacht? According to information we have, no. There was no danger. She felt no danger uh, at all. The argument was not over her. Now, Wilson says, there was no argument, terming it more of a discussion. Sheriff's investigator Roy Hamilton says he has no idea where the coroner's office got its information about an argument. Hamilton said he thinks the coroner, quote, was juicing the story up a little bit, end quote. And actor Christopher Walken, the man who was either arguing or talking with Robert Wagner that night, he'll also be requestioned. Asked about the coroner's comments, Walken replied, I didn't know the coroner was on the boat. I'll have a commentary later in the program about the performance of the coroner's office in this confusing case. Sheriff's Homicide Sergeant Dwayne Rajure says, quote, I'm hearing all kinds of rumors, but we don't know. In four or five days, we'll have all the answers. Last week, we spoke with Rod Stewart and Barry Manilow about the controversial system of open festival seating, where there are no reserved seats and it's every fan for himself. Two years ago, 11 people were crushed to death in Cincinnati when thousands rushed into the arena to get a spot near the stage. Both Stewart and Manilow stated they are strongly opposed to festival seating. They view it as uncontrollable and dangerous. Well, we went to Detroit Monday night to the Rolling Stones concert to see the situation for ourselves. It was wall-to-wall -wall people as 76,000 fans crammed into the Pontiac Silverdome. Although there were no major injuries reported when the fans entered the arena, thousands could have been hurt when, penned up like cattle, they were released into the parking lot. Only then to have to wait another four hours on line to get into the show. So potentially dangerous. We'll continue to cover this controversy for you as it develops. Broadway played host to an unusual opening last night. Robin Leach has the story. What happens if the leading lady of a Broadway musical wants to take a vacation? Well, if the leading lady is Lauren Bacall, you go and find someone who's going to keep tickets moving at the box office. And that's exactly what the producers of Woman of the Year did. They went and recruited Raquel Welsh. As with many other Hollywood stars over the past few seasons, Raquel Welsh is making her Broadway debut in this musical adaptation of the 1942 screen classic that starred Spencer Tracy and Katherine Hepburn. And it's a brave debut at that. Not only because Katherine Hepburn is just down the street still proving she's the original woman of the year, but because Raquel Welsh is stepping into the shoes of this year's Tony Award winner for Best Musical Actress. She's a tough act to follow, but I, 
I didn't try to copy her. You know, I saw that, that she did a real good job with the show and that she was really wonderful in this role. But I also saw it as a, as a part that I could do something with myself. So I haven't, I haven't really done anything kind of the way she does it. And as with all opening nights in New York, there was a lavish party at the Xenom Discotheque to congratulate Raquel on her stage debut and to celebrate Broadway's newest star. So Raquel, how do you really feel after opening night? Well, I, I'm really, I'm really stunned, Rob. And I mean, the only thing I can tell you is that it was really, absolutely the thrill of a lifetime. That's all. I mean, when I hit that stage, I had two shows today. I mean, they just bowled me over. I mean, I didn't even. All I did was stand there, you know. And I mean, I couldn't believe it. I really couldn't believe it. Who will be the Lauren Bacalls and Raquel Welches of tomorrow? Well, if getting a head start counts, they might have been in an awards presentation we attended last night. It was a stage parent's paradise last night in Studio City, California, where the third annual Youth in Film Awards were presented. While many of the nominated children were fairly young, there are those older children who are already thinking of their future. You really can't be stuck in being the precocious little child, or else you are going to be the precocious little child when you're 39. I think you have to realize as you grow older, you're going to have to expand, and sometimes you'll, you won't win with the chances that you take, but you'll learn, and that's the most important part. Dana Hill won the Best Young Actress in a TV Special Award, and Danielle Brisbois won the Best Young Actress in a TV Series Award. Gary Coleman was found betting with his father that his show would lose in its category. And if I lose, well, that's just $10 down the drain for me. While different strokes did lose to Father Murphy, Gary still won two awards, Best Young Comedian and Outstanding Contribution right, to man. Youth. It's great. <laughs> you bet it is. You know, I think they all should have won. CBS had a smash week in the primetime television ratings, putting eight programs on the top ten list. 60 Minutes was number one, and Dallas number two, recording a whopping 50 share. That means half of the TV sets in use tuned in. Overall, the CBS primetime programming had an audience share of 31. ABC was a distant second with a share of 25. NBC was one share point behind in third at 24. Hill Street Blues, rescued last season by eight Emmys and heavy promotion, had to rerun an episode last week due to problems in the aftermath of the writer's strike. No new script was available. And the rerun dropped Hill Street Blues down to number 34 on the Nielsen charts. The ratings spell trouble all around the dial for the season's new shows. Father Murphy on NBC ranked 40th. Today's FBI on ABC was 42nd. CBS's Shannon in 56th. Best of the West was in 59th for ABC. Give Me a Break on NBC, ranked 61st. And Open All Night, the ABC comedy, wound up a disappointing 68th out of the 73 shows rated by Nielsen last week. In the important morning ratings, Good Morning America is running strong, a 30 share in the first hour on ABC, whipping NBC's Today Show by four share points. The CBS Morning News, said to be the number one priority of a new command team at CBS, was way back in the three-way race with only a 12 share. Coming up, soulful singer Teddy Pendergrass tells what he looks for in a woman and a look at the past and present of the Kingston Trio. He started out as the lead singer for Melvin and the Blue Notes, but Teddy Pendergrass walked out on the group when it was at its peak to go solo, and his star has been rising ever since. Now 30 years old, Pendergrass has four platinum records, but his music is just part of the fascination he holds over his fans. His sultry singing style has also made him a colossal sex symbol. Tom Halleck talked to Pendergrass right after a recent concert in Las Vegas. Just turn it off now. Then baby come to me. Perhaps the secret to Teddy's success is his not-so-subtle use of sex to sell his songs and turn on his audience. Put that where you want it. Let's get cozy. Your music is real sexy. Do you think of yourself as a sex symbol? No. I mean, what is a sex symbol? What does it look like? I think that I have a strong masculine image. I have to
have to believe in the strong masculine image. It's the only way I know. And it's not just something I'm trying to sell. Well, at this point, it's commercial, but it's, it's just the way I am. And, and it's worked. I did not have to change what I believe in to make what I enjoy doing work for me. Let's take a shower. Shower together. I wash your body. You wash mine. Sex is not bad. I am not an exhibitionist. I think that would be bad. I am not the kind of person who comes on with his pants so tight, and you know, I'm not a disrespectful performer. I figure if you got it, you got it. And you don't have to do anything else about it. You just walk up and do it. What do you look for in a woman? What turns you on about a woman? I'll give you one thing. One thing, tell you the truth, it's crazy. I have a foot fetish. <laughs> Isn't that kind of left field? Yeah, some yeah. people do. Yeah. I, I look at a woman, I see how she wears her hair and her nails and her feet. It starts there. At the bottom. <laughs> at the bottom. It's the bottom line. <laughs> well, my mother always said variety is the spice of life. With acts like Pendergrass is getting steamy and others like Devo or the Plasmatics resembling punk guerrilla theater, is there any room these days for the tame, clean-cut folk music of the Kingston Trio? Well, the group is trying to make a comeback. Their reunion will be the subject of an upcoming public television Pledge Week special. We visited the Kingston Trio with a look then and now. The United States had just put its first satellite into orbit. Nasser had formed the United Arab Republic, and Eisenhower was our president. The year was 1958, and three young men calling themselves the Kingston Trio had taken the country by storm. Hang down your head, Hang down your head and run. But by 1961, times were changing. The Beatles were on their way, and the original Kingston Trio disbanded. That is, until recently, when more than 20 years later, Bob Shane, and Nick Reynolds, and Dave Gard got together for a one-time reunion. People lined the streets for a chance to see the trio they had idolized, including three fans who collectively flew 6,000 miles. What other group has fans that are that nuts about them? Few groups do, and for the trio in the 50s and 60s, it was hard work, fast-paced, and fun. We were just out of college, all business majors, all looking for, you know, easy jobs. We found one. It's like packing in a lot of information in a hurry. Boom, boom, just hauling it in. It's like those game shows where you pull a dollar off a tree or something like that. All you can grab. That was what it was. And finally, it got so that I had a library full. The fun and the fans lasted for four years. Then they felt the music got stale. We were not the kind of a group that could change and be accepted. The Beatles came on. I mean, who, who, who stood in front of that? <laughs> That's a freight train. You get out of the Beatles' way. But for just one night, no one was thinking of the Beatles or any other group. The night belonged to the Kingston Trio. Can you imagine me when a zombie white? Also reassuring to know that Robert Stack, who's become a symbol of law and order, is back on television. Entertainment Tonight went behind the scenes to talk to the star about his new role. In over 40 years in show business, Robert Stack has played hundreds of different roles. Despite his versatility as an actor, when people think of him, they think of one role. Elliot Ness of The Untouchables. You're never conscious of the fact you're going to be stuck in a character like that. Then all of a sudden I became Elliot Ness, which is really very far from me. But television does that. Television makes you, because you come every week on the set, I mean on, on, on the set, on the tube, and uh, you do it enough times and they believe that's what you are. Ironically, he plays a tough cop in his new series, Strike Force. This happens to be a character that interests me. Uh, people who handle themselves under stress interest me. 
And a cop today, all of a sudden, is in a position where he has no control. The, no, the rules don't exist anymore. They're what they call senseless violence now. People do things for no reason. Viewers disagree on the problem of violence on television, but Bob thinks that it has its place. You have to show the bad before you can show the good. The only thing is you must handle it with taste and not use it gratuitously and have screaming rubber and machine guns and blood for no reason because you've got lousy scripts and you're trying to keep the audience awake. Excuse me, sir, would you... Donation to the Reverend Moon? Juice for Jesus? Oh. Read about Jehovah's Witness. Stack doesn't always play the tough guy lead, though. He satirized that image in the film Airplane. Airplane was an obvious spoof that no one expected to work and has made upwards of close to $70 million. And it's, uh, <laughs> the reason it works is because it insults everybody. Nobody gets off scot-free. People are so polarized in their own little groups, the Irish, the Jews, the Catholics, the Protestants, and nobody ever can joke about anything. Well, this show takes everybody apart. And people, I think, like to laugh at themselves a little bit. He laughs about his life, too, and the change from playboy to a happy family man. Someone said the playboy settled down. Why? Because he got tired. He's old. Now, there was a big transition from being a, a bachelor to getting married and then putting the diapers on my daughter and the whole thing. It was a complete turnaround for me. This happens to many guys. I got married when I was 33. I was an old goat. Married 25 years. Uh, it's neat. And what you've got is a built-in fan club. And no matter how lousy the reviews are, and no matter what a disaster you've had on the set, I Love You, Daddy still sounds great when you come home at night. On tomorrow's show, Jane Fonda talks about her changing personal relationships. In our spotlight today, Eric Estrada about to sing for his supper. The toothy star of Chips will warble for the first time in public on an episode of that biker series now being shot. In it, Punch and John go undercover at a rock contest. And Estrada has to get up on stage and sing or blow his cover. His debut number, Celebration. From what we hear, Cool and the gang have nothing to worry about. Also in our spotlight, the Gary Marshall Fun Factory, where TV spin-offs are being spun off in all directions. In the planning stages is a show called Joni and Chachi, starring those two teenage cut-ups from Happy Days, Aaron Moran and Scott Bayo. And columnist Liz Smith reports that Leslie Easterbrook, who plays the big blonde would-be actress Rhonda on Laverne and Shirley, is also being considered for a series of her own. From the same era as Laverne and Shirley comes news that four big stars of that period, Fabian, Ed Kooky Burns, Bobby Sherman, and Annette Funicello, have just signed to do a Love Boat episode. The guys will play recent divorcees who all make a play for Annette, presumably to get at her Skippy peanut butter. No, I'm in enough trouble over foot fetishes. I'm not going to touch that line. Susie Gilstrap, a paraplegic in real life, made her acting debut in Skyward. Her performance was so moving that a sequel, Skyward Christmas, will air tomorrow night on NBC. A quiet field 40 miles outside Dallas, Texas, seems an unlikely place for an assault against prejudice. But that's exactly what happened here as the movie Skyward Christmas was shot last month. The show is not about a girl who's crippled. It's about a girl, her family, her friends, this crazy odd squad named Coop Billy at this, uh, at this little airport, and the lead happens to be in a wheelchair. That's all. And she leads her life in a chair, but it goes not, we, we don't go any further than that. And hopefully, uh, not only will America forget about the chair, but this will cross over into every industry, into every occupation, so prejudice isn't held against people anymore. I mean, we just don't have the right to judge. Even if the movie doesn't have that national impact, it was obvious that the crew had been affected by working with Susie. She's the heart and soul of the project, and uh, from her everything stems. And uh, from her we all learn great, great lessons in life and art and how to handle ourselves, which is more important than anything. She kept saying, one of these days, Dad, I'm going to do something real great, and she's proven it. You must be awfully proud of her. You betcha. That's the greatest girl in the world. <laughs> it's been great. It's been a, a fun time and a lot of hard work, but I love it. 
What's it like for you in school uh, as far as the reaction of your friends? Oh, I think they like it. <laughs> I think so. Um, I get a lot of, you know, things like, oh, Susie's stuck up now because she's on TV. And I just have to kind of ignore that. You know? Have you had to sign many autographs? Yeah. <laughs> Which is really weird because who would want my autograph? <laughs> Any time a major figure like Natalie Wood dies under circumstances which raise questions or suggest even the hint of mystery, you can be sure the story will be pounced on from all directions by a lot of people who simply want to get at the truth and by others, human nature being what it is, who hope to find something other than the obvious. That's why it's so important for people in our business to be extremely careful and reserved in what we report to you. And what goes for us is true in spades for the authorities. And to be blunt, the Los Angeles County coroner blew his responsibility in that department when, in giving an autopsy report, he said that Robert Wagner and Christopher Walken had been engaged in an argument, a nonviolent argument, prior to Natalie Wood's death. Besides being out of place in an autopsy report, those remarks fed a rumor mill which was already wildly overflowing with speculation. And more important, they were apparently wrong. A senior homicide detective who was investigating the death has said he has no information about any argument and the coroner's office itself has now hastily backpedaled from the word. But the damage has already been done. And a good part of it has been done to the credibility of the coroner. This is not the first time this particular individual has grandstanded. The investigation into Natalie Wood's death goes on. There are unanswered questions. The days ahead may produce new information. But as of now, Natalie Wood died accidentally and tragically. It is a great loss, and that is all that can responsibly be said. Thank you for joining us. We'll be in the same seats tomorrow with some new insights into Jane Fonda plus country star Mel Tillis. We leave you with some more of the great sounds of Teddy Pendergrass. Goodbye.